morning and welcome to another Bible study. We are on lesson one, the second epistle of Peter, and we will be looking at wrapping up 2 Peter 1, 1 to 4. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we gather together to study your word, we are nothing, so we need your divine aid. We ask that you will send your spirit to be with us. May angels tabernacle with us. We pray for the various internet connections that people, we pray for each person here present. We pray for our family members. We pray that your angels will encamp around all of us. And may your words be here and heard in what is being shared. And may we leave this study knowing more about you, knowing you better and loving you more. Lord, we can't do all of this. And we can't ask anything of ourselves. So we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, Amen. All right, so we are in Second Peter, and I'm going to be sharing that on the screen. And so we have, I'm just going to go over, of course, it's an interactive study. But at first, I'm going to read Second Peter 1, 1 to 4. Just give a little backdrop on what we have covered so far and then pick up in question 15. So 2 Peter 1, 1 to 4 goes like this. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The apostle, the stress which the apostle Peter lays upon a knowledge of quad is quite noticeable. You'd realize it says in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Lord Jesus Christ. And it went down again in verse 3. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain it unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. So it's very noticeable that Peter does stress the importance of the knowledge of God twice in this lesson it is mentioned he would evidently impress upon the, our minds the necessity of a personal acquaintance with god of knowing him as we would an intimate friend of loving him not simply because of what he does but because of what he is you know there are many people in the world today who yeah i know god we know of him but do we have that intimate relationship with God that is important? As it says, it's not about loving him, not because of what he does. And there are some people, oh, I'm gonna, I love God when I believe God is showing me with blessings. If it looks like he's not showing me and I'm not getting what I want, you know what? The relationship is strained. God, we love God, not because of what he does, but because of what he is. And what he is, is love. God is love. This is something that we really need to know in our core. So that no matter what is happening, that we can explain. Why is there fire in Maui burning down people's houses? They're losing everything. Why is my loved one suffering? Why is this person battling this? We, while we might not have the answer to this, what we know is that God is love. And we love him because he has first loved us. He didn't wait until to see if Rob was good enough or if Moinda was going to be. He loved us first. So we love him. That's what scripture says. 
It is the perception of his character which first draws us to him. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Romans 2 verse 4. The goodness of God. Was it Sister Taryn and Andrew? Not Taryn, Sister Yulaine and I think Sister Andrea mentioned it during the praise time. How good God is. You know, rain came and flooded the sister car and she could be focused on that. But she says God is good. Today he sent sunshine. God is good. And this goodness of God leads us to repentance. Leads us to see that we are not so good. We're not good at all. We need his goodness to make. And you know, when talking about getting his goodness, look at it. It says, by this we are made partakers of the divine nature. So we can partake in the divine nature that is adopted into the family of god so we have a new blood running through our vein as sons of god it necessarily follows that our acquaintance with him must become more and more intimate it is so sad today how satan is destroying families how he's allowing how oh, people are allowing him to destroy families, to separate people. People going off in silo, mother hitting children, children hitting mother, father, and, and all of that. As families, God is showing us. He wants us, that the family of God shows us what we should be in our families. Pulling together. When families, you find that, I don't know if you, and, and please feel free to interject. You know, when you are part of a company, if you like a part of your friendship group growing up, you find that words you didn't say, you start saying because that's what you do in your family. I remember growing up where I grew up, there was two blood families living side by side. And in Kingston, we have, I mean, we talk like, oh, I'm talking. But this family had a drawl in what they're talking. And we realized the parents thought that way. And everybody in the, even though they were the only two families in the community spoke like that. Because that's their family. That's what they do. So when we're a part of God's family, we do what God's family does. And we are allowed to be partakers of divine nature. If we may not have been like that before, it is possible for us. As sons of God, it necessarily follow that our acquaintance with him must become more and more intimate. You become more and more intimate with a person when you spend time with them. I know as a family, as a church family here, we love each other. And I know we love each other. And I have a feeling why we love each other this much is because we spend time together. You know, we love our other brothers and sisters all over the world and we pray for them. But everybody here is special and even a little more special because we spend more time. We are here on Sabbath. We talk during the week on our WhatsApp. And we meet on Wednesday night when we can't. I mean, we meet on Wednesday night every Wednesday night. Those who meet on Wednesday night. So getting more and more intimate with people is spending time with them. To know them. And guess what? To have them rubbing you the wrong way and you rubbing them the wrong way and you forgive and you know what I'm saying? And you make up and then your love is even stronger. So we need to get intimate, more intimate with God. It is this intimate acquaintance with God which multiplies the peace to us. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Now, as we... We talked about some of the turmoils that are going on in people's life. Are we at peace while we are going through these things? If we are not experiencing peace among our turmoil, it could imply we are not as intimate with God as we should be. It sounds bad. I'm not saying that there won't be a problem. I'm not saying when something, a, a, a thing hits you in your face, it won't push you back. But what is going to be our thought process as we are processing this? Are we going to be at peace? If we acquaint ourselves with God, we will be at peace no matter the storm. Galatians 4 verse 6. And we like Galatians 4 verse 6 because it says, And because he is son, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. There is some more to Galatians 4 verse 6. If somebody could read verse 7 to 9, I'd be grateful. So Galatians 4, 6 to 9. If you would read all of that for me, please. 
All right. Thank you. The six to nine. Yes. And because they are sons, God had sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. For by then, when ye known, when ye knew not God, ye did serve unto them which are by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereto ye desire again to be in bondage? So it is evident, it says, the Apostle Paul makes a knowledge of God equivalent to the state of sonship. It is evident, therefore, that the knowledge of God of which the Apostles speak is far more than the simple knowledge and belief that God exists as creator of the world. All right, so that text that Sister Yelaine read, we're going to go into it some more as we look about the heirship, the sonship, and all of that as we go through this lesson. So let me back up with lesson question number 15. And I know we looked at this a little bit last week, but we want to look at it and then we go on to the next chapter. What does Paul say we do in view of these promises? Now remember, we told that we have been given exceeding great and precious promises we're being given exceeding great and precious promises what should we do in view of the promises that we have been given second corinthians 7 verse 1 could someone read that for me please second corinthians 7 1 having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So what would you say is the answer to that question? We're to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. What about if I just keep a little bit, you know, I remember I went to school. I don't remember if Donna was in that religious education class, but religious education was a big deal. For the school I went to, it was a, we went to Catholic all girls school. And I remember the priest giving a lecture and he said, and he was explaining how you make it to heaven and who make it and who not. So he says, basically, if your good outweighs the bad, you know, you can make it right. If your bad is more than your good, you will go to hell. But if they're on kind of like equal terms, you basically go to purgatory and kind of wait things out till you can work yourself up to go in the, you know, get the good part going. Do we have any comment on that? Because this year is saying we should escape the corruption. We should cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. This explanation that I got from the priest kind of let me know that I really need to get off most, get rid of most of my filthiness because if my goodness exceed the badness, I'm pretty safe. I would like to expand a little bit on the word filthiness because okay. this is the word that we use, not really exploring what we call filthy. When you wear a clothes and you your clothes and you fall in the dirt or somebody's passing with the car, they will splash you with dirt water you call it filthy this is just a simple uh, coat of water that fell onto you but when you look at filthiness in the way that uh, we are talking about here it means to me that we have to go inside out starting with our brain removing all thoughts that keeps us captive all ideas, all anger, all grudges, all tea, you know, that we have in us that keeps us like on fire for doing wrong all the time. These are the things we have to get rid of. These are the things we have to shed out of ourselves. 
not to just say the word filthy, dirty, and then that's it. But we have to go deeper into it to cleanse our mind and fill it with the word of God, with the love of God, with the, the promises of God that he gave us to enjoy, get rid of those things that keep us in bondage. Sometimes we don't even know what they are. It, and they come up one after the other, one after the other. The little things we think that's not thing. When you look at it in the eyes of God, they come like a big whole thing that we cannot carry. We have to put it down at the feet of Christ and let Christ take it for us so we can be en enlightened with the word, with the love, and with, with all those promises that God gives us. There is a big word to do, the, a big thing to do with this word so we can become really the way like God wants us to be. Okay. That's why I wanted to enlighten, uh, uh, you know, right. bring a little. All right. Thank you for talking about that. Did anybody want to answer the question that I asked? Is that logical, Ooh. what I stated? Is that the truth of the gospel? It's logical in many people's minds but it's not the truth of the gospel no the truth of the gospel is we're to be holy as our father in heaven is holy in him there is no filthiness there's no unrighteousness scripture tells us that we are to be cleansed from all unrighteousness from everything that is not pure we're told all unrighteousness is sin and so if we have unrighteousness in us then we have sin dwelling in us it says here in the verse we read second corinthians 7 1 let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit it didn't say from some it didn't say from most it says from all perfecting holiness in the fear of god you can't perfect holiness if you still have filthiness so God is wanting to rid us of all that. What we need to understand is, although it says, let us cleanse ourselves, mm -hmm. we can't do this by ourselves. We don't, first off, we don't even have the understanding. Like the priest that you mentioned, well, as long as the one outweighs the other, then it's okay. No, that's a false understanding there's no way that will cover all filthiness. And when we try and go by our, our own understanding, then we're definitely going to fall way short. So when we look at the scriptures, then we see that, you know, whatever is not a faith is sin, which would mean it's unrighteousness, it's filthiness. So everything about us is to become enveloped in faith in God, in trusting God at his word and at his power to do what he says. Tying this back into Second Peter, it is as we trust God that we per become partakers of his divine nature, as we let him cleanse us from the filthiness that's in us and put his character within us, put his ways in us. As Edmund just put up, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's what it is God's trying to do. And until that is clearly done, there's no way we can be rid of all filthiness because until we have a, a new heart and a right spirit. We have a heart that is corrupted by sin and chooses sin. Maybe not in every instance, but, you know, where God wants us to have a heart, heart that chooses sin in no instant, not just in a few, but in none whatsoever. And so... That's what we're looking at here is letting him take over our life so that we are no longer in rebellion to him and he can rid us of every bit of filthiness in our lives and have only righteousness.
Thank you. If you, I can't see all the chat, but there's some very interesting thing in the chat. Keith posted something in the chat about filthiness and some other folks have put some things in the chat. So be glancing at that as well, because there's some very good information. Like just as you just said, Rob, we have Robert and Jeannie that agreed with you that we are all, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness as filthy rags and we fail away. And Edmund put in creating us a clean heart. So when it tells us to, we must, it, it puts like it put the onus on us to, we must, you know, perfect, whatever. As you said, we can't do this. Our act in it is to submit to God and have God do this for us, in us, and, and, and through us. And he's willing to do so. Again, remember, as the text says, we're studying in Second Peter 1 to 4. It talks about, according as his divine power has given us all things, and it talks about us being able to, Verse 4, partakers of divine nature. That's how we are going to be able to overcome. All right, question number 16. Having become sons of God, what other promise necessarily follows? So, you have been adopted. You are son of God, children of God. What other promise necessarily follows? Romans 8, 16 and 17. And also, somebody please find... 1 John 3, verse 2. So Romans 8, verse 16. Romans 8, 16 and 17. Verse 17, somebody quoted earlier and put in the chat. But starting with verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. So it makes it very plain here who we're heirs of, mm -hmm. and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. All right. So in this one, what other promise follows with this whole sonship that we're hearing here? That we are joint heirs with Christ of the things of God. And that will be glorified with him as well. Do you see, do we realize how, I mean, this is just pretty awesome. This is excellent. This is something we don't deserve. We have never worked for. Imagine Bill Gates calling you, Rob. I don't know his name of his children. Like, hey, Rob, I want to make you join here with my kids. So I'm putting you on my will so that, I mean, that would be ridiculous, unbelievable. You know, and that, yeah. that can't touch god the owner of this universe the creator of everything all things and making us beneficiaries of his goodness and all of that is good but to put us on the level to be joined with his son his perfect son and for the son to be okay with that he said he's not afraid to call us brethren right he sees us as his brothers and sisters. That is amazing. That's an amazing promise. So we become joint ear. We become ears of God and joint ear. Let me just say this though. In the royal family in England, Jamaica, we were colonized by the British. So, you know, we had to know a lot of what's going on in the royalty there. And they have certain rules and certain things. And I remember when Lady Di passed away. She was getting, she had to be calm, even though she herself was, you know, of whatever kind of blood, had to be acclimated into what's acceptable and what's not. So with when Megan went in, you know, if you're a part of the royal family, as a woman, you have to wear the hats wherever, you have to wear the gloves, you have to know how to wave. When you go to eat, you can't start before the quit. There was a whole lot of rules and stuff that we don't even know of because they're kingdom rules. And there are certain expectations because you belong to a particular kingdom. We belong to the kingdom of God. There are kingdom rules and there are some behaviors that is expected. And the thing about it is when we become adopted into that kingdom, we don't have to force those behaviors. If we submit ourselves, you know, we are not just given a list of expectation and say, do these. We're given a list of promises, a lot of promises to say, here, now that you have accepted my son and he is now the head of your race, you know what? These are the things that I'm going to be doing 
This is who you are. This is who you are because I say so. And I have the power to do that in you. I mean, I think that's pretty amazing. 1 John 3, verse 2. Somebody can read that, please. I'll read. Thank you. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Contemplate this verse. It said, beloved, now are we sons of God. This part, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. What does that mean? Can you translate that in a English that everybody can understand? Clearly. What is that saying? Reword it. When I read it, it tells me that we are not really sure what we will be like. I mean, we have a lot of suppositions about the body being transfigured into a spirit, etc. But we really don't know. But we know that we will become like Christ. And that is something to look forward to. So we don't know yet. So it won't be this physical body that we are used to this flesh and the various colors and the problems it causes and such. We will just all be one. And it's just something that I look forward to, that unity with Christ. And just what we're talking about before, being joint heirs. And I mean, being brethren with the Son of God and the Father saying we are his children. So it just encapsulates the whole wonder of the change that will be made into, but we don't know what will be exactly. We can only speculate now on this earth. Go ahead, Rob. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, my, my thoughts looking at this is we don't understand the extent of how God is going to change us. We, we don't understand the extent of what God is like. And if we're going to be like him, we, if we don't understand what he's like, we can't understand what we're going to be like. We see ourselves now. We can see some of the changes God is making in us. But even that is nothing compared to what he is eventually going to do. Amen. Both yeah. of you are correct. When it says it does not get appear, you can't even imagine. Because it's yeah. not even to say, well, we don't fully understand. We don't know. It could be bad. It could be. No. It's going to be amazing. You can't even understand. You don't even know. You don't even know. You just wait. You just wait. But all we know, what we can know is we are going to be like Christ. We are going to be like Christ. Now, ver question 7 says, 17. Well, that, can, can, I want to point out two things with what you're saying right here. Because you, you looked at verse 2. But verse 1 tells us why this is. It's because the Father loves us. He's not looking for slaves. He's not looking just to have children. He's looking for trying to, because he loves us, he's doing this. And then in verse 3, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So that right there shows also the extent of what we're talking about. It's, it's not just having some little changes take place here and there but we become purified that's what god is seeking to do is to purify us amen amen can I say something? absolutely sister Kaz. okay we must remember that we are just men and women of this earth we may die we may return to the dust and there is no lasting satisfaction in our praise and honor but I mean, when I said praise and honor, I mean the praise and the honor that we get from our brothers and our sisters or family members and friends. But the honor that comes from God is lasting. And to be hearers of God and joint hearers with Christ is to be entitled um, or, or to be compared to unsearchable riches. Therefore, I should say that is very valuable in comparison with, with gold and silver or even any gems of the earth should sink in comparison to the honor that Christ bestowed upon us or that God bestowed upon us. And remember that through Christ, where the Bible says that through Christ, we are offered joy unspeakable and eternal weight of glory. And we have been told that I have not seen nor hear heard, 
neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. In verse 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Therefore, let me say this, through personal prayer, or I should say through personal effort, joined with the prayer of faith, our soul is trained day by day, and our character grows into the likeness of Christ. And finally, instead of being just the sport of circumstances, and instead of us indulging in selfishness, are just carrying away by light and trifle conversations, according to what the, the, the scripture says, we may become like Christ day by day. It may cost us severe conflict to overcome habits or our sinful habits or habits that we have long indulged in, you know. But day by day, we may become like him. And that's an honor because the Bible said through obedience and love of the will and the commandments of God, then we may become like Christ. Remember what we are, what we must perfect is the character. It's not our sinful nature. It is our character. And so the Bible tells us that when he comes in the twinkling of an eye, we will become like Christ. But it is a character that, notice what the spirit of prophecy keeps saying, that it is a character that is to be perfected. So day by day, by beholding him, we become like him in character. Thank you, Sister Kaz, for sharing that. Question number seven, what must follow if a man really has this hope in him? And I think we kind of touched on that. Somebody could read verse three. We said it basically purify it says and every man that has this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure we touched on it a lot question number 18 what is the corruption that is in this world through loss we read about that corruption in second peter second peter 4 1 verse 4 says whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these the promises he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world that is in the world to us. So apparently those who have the divine nature are those who have escaped the corruption of the world. So what is the corruption of the world to us that we are, that this is talking about? And we are back again in 1 John 2 verse 15 and 16. Somebody find that. And Matthew 15, 19 and 20. If you find it, please go ahead and read. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Matthew 15, 19 and 20. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defile not a man. So Anybody just want, thank you, Sister Yelena and Brother Rob. Anybody want to just expound on what is this corruption that is in the world that is being referred to? You know, Faye, I, I just like to add my little thoughts yeah. on this because I interact with a lot of young people, teenagers. My life growing up, I look at and the corruption, the lust of the world. We are taught to love the material things of this world. And just like when we look at the various, the floods, the fires, everything, we're losing things out. Oh, my Lord, I'm losing all of this. So we, we love things. We love appetite. It's just different loss. We have the sexual desires, the transgender agenda that's going on. And the world is just chaotic. And when I talk to my younger brothers, cousins, nieces, nephews, etc., I sort of reflect and say how hard it is. Because even in sort of designing and you're thinking of careers, what you're going to do, we often think of how much money we're going to earn to sort of define the sort of career that we're going to have. So the world has led us not to focus on Christ and what Christ offers and to see the righteousness through Christ, but is to seek satisfaction 
through these material things that envelop into lust and all of these things that we're not really paying attention to. I mean, my brother was here the other day and I mean, we are looking at everything and in every situation that we have come together, it's about food, what we'll eat, we'll, the different pizzas and stuff. It's not even healthy food that they're going after, the drinks. So the, the various things that just distract us. And I will try to say, all right, let's try to read even a chapter of the Bible and sort of infuse God's word. And I mean, they look at me and smile like, where is she coming from with this? So is the world has just distracted us in such a serious way to take us away from the word of God in terms of changing our characters for this humility, the submission to God that is required for us to, if we want to go to the, I mean, go to the kingdom of heaven to be with Christ, etc. And it's a conversation. I don't know if any of you have tried it with young people. But when you start, it is like they are looking at you. Where is she coming from with all of this? So God is so strange to all of us. And the love of God that we're talking about and wanting to be called sons of God. And which is why we have such, I don't even want to say duty. That's our network. Sharing. Sharing of what we are experiencing now in our lives. The wonders that we experience just by the knowledge of God and knowing him and trying to build that closer relationship through the knowledge that we get every day. So when I read this and the corruption that is in the world through lust, that is what I'm seeing. Lost in all of the material desires that we are told should make us happy but there's no fulfillment in it because if god isn't in it there is no fulfillment that's just my little piece yeah amen and sister andrea even christian youth and even adults as well it's just so sad because god ways seem too simple he says seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and everything else will be added mm -hmm, yeah. it's like we live in a world where everybody's trying to solve their own problems and, you're, and it's true in terms of career. You have young people, they want to choose, they want money and they want it fast. They want it quick. They don't want to go through a person that worked how many years and build up this. No, they want that now. And this impatience, which probably boils down to even covetousness. It's just amazingly sad. Yeah, I'm going to do this. Why do you want to become a doctor? Do you know how much money doctors make? It's not anymore that I want to help people. I want to do this. It's like money is a drive. Material things is a drive. But with all the disasters and things that are happening in this world today, it should tell us that material things are nothing. I mentioned the brother, my very, very dear friend, who the one who got flooded out. This was one more thing in the mix. I remember when two years ago, we used to meet, he used to preach at our church at least once or twice a month. And he would be marking down the days to his retirement. He was so looking forward to retirement. And a couple of weeks ago, he contacted me and he says, August 31st, that's it. He retires. He retires. I've been work home. And that is just, and I was just so happy with him. And I said, I remember you used to count down the days and you told us it was X number of hundred or whatever days left. It was back that time it was like two plus two and a half or whatever years, but he did it in terms of days and he was counting it down. One month, not, not the month of his retiring, the month of his retiring, the whole community get flooded. His house is flooded out. Everything is destroyed. The house was in a flood zone. It cannot be insured. I hear Sister Yelaine say, those Maui people, thank God for insurance. We don't I know. Heard. I heard. Uh, whoever said it, I don't. It was who? No, it, it was her. But okay. I, I heard it too. Yes. Yeah, not everybody's house is insured. Not everybody can afford insurance. And not every place where you live, it's insurable. This brother's place was not insurable. No, you imagine this. Can you imagine all the thought? He's going to put all this thing into doing God's work now. He's going to whatever. You know what? I may work one day or two days. I don't know. But I'm so looking forward to my retirement. Your house is destroyed. If you're at the age of retirement, I don't know if... A bank is going to give you for a mortgage right and not just that when this is somebody who knows about the time of life that we are living in that everything economy and all of that will be collapsing soon 
do you want to get a mortgage? You know what I'm saying? So it's like this test was so big and bold. I thank God that God has made a way of escape for him that he probably didn't even think about. God, I tell you, his attitude was really good going through it. I remember the day of the flood. He had put it on Facebook and the water was up. The water actually reached up to his chest. Excuse me. And his dog was just having a ball in the flooded place. But anyway, I'm just saying we have to take our eyes off material things. Yes, we need to survive. We need to buy food for now. We need to buy clothes. We need to be all of these things. But you know what? God has promised to supply our needs. And if our goal, if our goal in life is to please God, is to fear God, know that God will give us everything we need. He will open that door of opportunity with that job. He will give that promotion to give that extra money that you need. He has a thousand ways of which we don't know of. It pains my heart when I see people grieving because they don't know how they're going to manage with this. We don't know, but we serve a God who is love. We talked about that earlier in the subject. If we really need to understand God is love and everything that he allows to happen to us is actually filtered through love. He would not have allowed it. I mentioned Rob and I was on the other and some of us, I think Zach was there and some others on Daniel Mesa this morning when, cause we've been going to the book of Job and his friends, Job friends miserable comforters were talking to him yes it must be something bad it must be you must have done something bad because god would not be punishing you like that obviously they didn't know god they didn't realize that there was a force outside of that situation they were only saying job this is between you and god and you and god alone that's why you're suffering no there's the adversary out there that was causing havoc in job's life and there are adversaries in our lives want to cause havoc too but remember just like he could not touch job without the father of love saying okay satan can't touch you and i unless god said all right and if god says okay he has a purpose he has a purpose let's take our minds off the things of this world for me i'm finding the world more of more when i say fearful as, let, i don't want to say fearful i want to say distasteful i can't stand it here i can't stand it here when i think of all the other things we just discovered what face what zoom now is, is is doing you know in terms of it's not just okay when you put your things on youtube they are going to do this and they are going to do this so you can talk what you want on zoom but be careful when it goes on youtube now as a matter of fact, without even turning on one bit of equipment, you have a smartphone or some smart thing inside your place. You have to be careful. I mean, this world, we don't belong here. We don't belong here, but we don't have to live in fear. I just want to say that. We don't have to live in fear. We can escape the corruption in this world. When we think of, and I think of a situ the situation I mentioned briefly when I was going through with the work situation in terms of, you know, somebody being angry and, you know, people want to move up. They want to be better. So it's like, this is their, I tell myself, this is their kingdom. Unless they surrender to God, they'd have nothing else to look forward to outside of here. And so they're clamoring after that promotion. They're clamoring after. We don't have to. We pursue God. We pursue God and we watch God work in our life. We watch God provide everything that we need. And sometimes what we need is a little bit of suffering to drive us to our needs to make us build our faith. Because that's what we need at the moment. Because he wants us to have faith. And in order to have faith, you have to exercise it. So you're going to get the opportunity to exercise it. But where are you going to get that faith from? You're going to have to go to the Word. The Word builds the strength and then He gives, allows the opportunities to exercise it. Let us escape the corruption of this world. We can. We can. It, the, the text you read, it says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so many of us really love the world, but we don't want to ad admit that we love the world. What are some of the signs? What are some of the signs? And I want to be practical. How can you know for yourself or you see it in others? You, it's not your responsibility to go point it out in people. But just so we have here, what are some of the signs that a person is a lover of the world? Does it mean that, oh, they go party and they drink and they smoke and, oh, they love the world? What are some of the signs? Just briefly. No, we gather more and more toys. Ha! <laughs> huh. 
our, our boats, our cars, our TVs, whatever else it may be. It can be bicycles, uh, exercise equipment, whatever. We're, we're gathering more things to ourselves. You know, I tell you, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't buy things or get things that we no. want. It doesn't mean that. But let's look at the way we accumulate stuff. You know, funny enough, you said that. I smiled this morning as I was going in my bedroom. I smiled. I was making my bed. And I said, my bedroom isn't made the way we wanted it. We, the, the way we designed this house, it was supposed to be bigger. And the person would decide to do what they wanted. And I said to myself, if that wall was back, I smiled. And I said, you know what? Because I was looking at how many comforters I have. I smiled to myself. And I said, you know what? The Lord know what he was doing while, while he made this room so small. Because if he had made it bigger and I had more storage space, I probably would get more stuff I'm putting there. And I don't see myself as a law of the world. But I said, you know, I smile. I said, hmm. And I smile. Because here it is. I have, I'm not going to tell you number. It's a small number compared to a lot of people in terms of how many comforters and whatever you can switch out. You know, that kind of thing. And I'm like, I mean, it'd be nice to have some more. I'm thinking in my head. But you know what? I've been surviving how many years with just that? I said, if I had, you know, if I had a bigger place, I would have had put more place for storage. We want storage to store stuff just in case we might use it. Just in case. You know what? Other people are suffering. So one way of, of sharing that we really love the world is when we, the accumulation of stuff. Another way of loving the world is thinking like the world. When we allow worldly people to influence what we do and how we go about doing business, how we go about doing stuff, we're, we don't put the God principle. This world is made up, is different than God's kingdom. A lot of ways, oh God, God says, seek me first and I'll give you everything after. It don't make sense. I remember my brother-in-law, he's now a Christian, in his church, but back then when I was, I was gonna have all levels, Jamaica's know you have certain examinations that you need to take. And I'd be going to Wednesday night meeting and I'd be going to Crusade. And I was like, you're not doing this right. You know, if you want to pass, you're going to have to put in the time to study. And I'm like, yeah, I need to put the time to study, but I have to put God's work first. He couldn't understand that you put God's work first. Guess what? I'm going to pass the exam then. I'm going to do that because God, that's the way to succeed. But it's so simple that we are so accustomed to, if it's too good to be true, then it's probably not too good. God's way is simple, and it's true. Sister Yolay. Yeah. You had me read Matthew 15, verse 8, 19 and 20, while we were talking about the filthiness. These are the things that we can see as filth in a human being. That I wanted to bring that to our attention to people that are that, that, Take away what I was saying because things we have in our heads, they might not be godly. If and if they are not godly, they are filth. This is what we have to start shedding out of ourselves to the mind and let God fill you up with His spirit, with His knowledge, with His love, and the things we need to better ourselves and get close to God as He allows us to be. I just wanted to bring that to. All right, thank you, Sister Yelene. I don't yeah. know, are you hearing a lot of noise from my background? Got a generator is on, the rain is going, thunder is going, lightning. Is it sounding noisy? I Maybe. hear the rain, but not too hard. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's okay. All right, exactly. uh, so, all right thank you. Okay, Brother Rob. Yeah, I, I do want to say with this that to have things is not necessarily unbiblical. It's not against God for somebody to have a boat or a car or even two houses or even three or four houses. It's more why they want these things. And, you know, some people God has blessed with multiple millions and even billions of dollars. Well, he's done that for reasons. And what he allows them to, or tells them to buy these things between him and them if we're just amassing things for our own glory in some way if it's because i want this i want that 
that's when we know that it's the lust of the flesh gaining what you want and that is not god's way at all brother royal go ahead yes brother Rob, i disagree with that that it is god blessing them because satan can give you things and stuff yes he can and satan knows the word of God better than any one of us. And for someone to be using the word of God for personal gain, that's deception. So all those riches that they are acquiring right now, are they going to give it back when they like come to the realization that what they are doing is wrong, even though they know that it is wrong? I, I believe it's, it's the devil doing all of that because they know what they are doing. I mentioned before, I, I saw this video where this pastor was like cursing out his congregation that they didn't buy him some Movado or watch or something for his birthday, you know? And when we see these things, because even when Jesus was being tempted, by Satan. Look at what he promised. Uh, I'm the one who created everything. You know, so we, and earlier someone mentioned something about the careers we choose. Honestly, most of the things, if you're not going to make a whole heap of money, or, or if you're not making enough money to live a certain lifestyle, a lot of people not going to choose that job because it's not necessarily about what we love sometime, but how much money we can bring in. And even in stuff like that, we have to be careful because the devil, he knows our desires also. He knows the kind of life we want to live. And he can, I believe, he can uh, allow us to get that job and that money to have us distracted and end up going on the wrong path instead of focusing on God and allowing God to provide for us because a lot of time we want to provide for ourselves. We don't want to wait on anything. And the more riches, the more money we have. And we tend to be that way. That depends on the individual. I've had a number of people speak against those who are rich as if everything they have is from the devil. I've had people do that. Living here in Charlotte and doing the work that I do, I have come across some very rich people. And I will tell you, the majority of the ones who I've known anyway to have lots of money, like one of them is a, a family that owns several car dealerships and a NASCAR team. Now, I met the wife. I didn't meet the husband whose name is on everything. I met the wife. And she was not staying around the house while I was working because she was on her way to her Bible study group. Now, just because she goes to a Bible study group doesn't really make her a Christian. I get that. But I tell you, the way that she was, if she did, if she wasn't a Christian, she sure put a lot of them to shame. Just because a person has money doesn't mean that they're not a Christian. And I think as, as a lot of us, we have a tendency to look at things that way. And we really condemn those that have more than we do. So we have to be careful with that. I do agree that Satan can prosper us. God can prosper us also. And it's not whether or not we're prosperous in, in money or so forth as to whether we're on God's side or Satan's side. It's what is our attitude about it? How do we use that which God has given to us? So we, we've got to be careful with that, I think. Um, thanks for sharing that, Rob. And that is true. I see your hand, Sister Yelaine. 
The Bible said it's yeah. God, that God gives well and had and had no troubles to it. There's a scripture about that. So we can't just say, and I didn't hear because my internet went out for a little while. We can't say everybody who gets well is from the devil. We know some are. And it's actually, you know, sometimes um, being wealthy is a bigger test than being poor. I didn't hear the backdrop of the problem. You want to say your name? Yes. One minute. Brother Royal, you want to say something? Uh, yeah. Say your yeah. Hold on, yes. yes. Hold on, hold on, Sister Elaine. Hold on, Sister Elaine. Let me just hear Brother Royal. Okay. I know you were, he's just... Yes, yeah. We weren't saying, or I wasn't saying everyone that is wealthy, is it from the devil? A question was asked about um, the prosperity gospel. Oh. And is it from God or from the devil? Yes. My opinion is that it is from the devil. In a biblical yeah, so I, I was just making a comment okay. and mention some other things. Also. Okay. All right, okay. thank you. So, what Sister Yelaine, that, that clears up a lot. Sister Yelaine? Yes, what I have to say about that. Some pastors, I won't say all of them, because um, they use their congregation to amass fortunes. Because those people come to the church with the idea that by coming to prayer, to meeting, to 40 days of, what do they do on the 40 days of worship, whatever they come to do in the church, they will get what they are looking for because God will see their sacrifice. To give their time, they come every day, they bring the time, they bring the gift, they bring this, they bring that. But the pastors, in the long run, seeing the weakness of those people, seeing the way they, they are open and, how would I say that? They're open to give. They're waiting for something in return and they're giving everything they have. Sometimes some of them don't even have it to give. They bring it and now they're abusing those members. They're abusing those who don't have anything and they come to give and now they, they put their, their veto upon them. I want this, I want that, I want our airplanes, I want fast airplanes, I want fast cars, I want bigger. And then the poor people, they are living in the huts. They are living in the huts. They don't have food to eat and they're giving to the. That's where now the things become a sin by letting money take over the work for the Lord. They don't right. work for the Lord anymore because they're taking over the people's belonging to amass wealth. And we have many of them who have done that, okay. which is not godly. It's not, not godly to do that. So. Amen. So let's hear from Brother mm -hmm. Robert and then Brother Keith. And you're right. As you're talking about, those pastors are basically demonstrating what we talk about here in the scripture, the love of the world. So whatever me they're trying to amass, what's the motive? Brother Robert and then Brother Keith. Yeah, the reason I asked that question with the prosperity minister is I don't believe that a blessing would be from God because I don't think that God would make somebody rich like that, which would be, to me, encouraging sin because those people are not leading people to God. So that's why I presented that question. And it's, and with what Brother Rob was saying you know, about God blessing people, to, other people to be rich, how we use that money. If, if we had a, a rich bank account, are we laying up our treasures in heaven or are we laying up our treasures in the bank? I mean, I think that God is testing people, like uh, giving them wealth to test people to see if they are going to use that money for good or use that money to line their pockets. You look at the General Conference of Seventh day Adventists. In the 80s, they had invested something like $500 million in the stock market. That's gambling. And they actually lost millions of dollars. And today, they're, the money that they're investing in the stock market is probably in the billions. And is that laying out treasures in heaven? Are they doing God's work? They could have people out there all over the place preaching the gospel, but they're lining their pockets. So I don't think those blessings are from God. All right. Thanks for sharing that, Robert. I appreciate it. Brother Keith, would you mind share what you are about to share, please? So uh, a couple of thoughts just to tee off what Brother Rob said. That I quoted in the in the chat, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, talks about another gospel. Something about those televangelists, what's so awesome about that is all those tithes that they get to keep tax-free. So they don't pay tax on that because they're a religious institution. So they make a lot of money on all of that stuff. And that's like free money to them. Just to put that into biblical context, if that were of God, 
then Jesus should have been wealthy beyond means. Why do I say that? Because if Jesus is really the, uh, the son of the father, and this is the way God works, then Jesus should have been blessed beyond measure when he walked the earth. The earth. He should have been rolling in like the, the latest, high, greatest sandals and the new, newest tunic and a new chariot every week. No, but see, that's not it. So I think what happens is they're praying on the... So when you read Second Peter 1.4, the word lust there translated in the, new, in the King James is actually the Greek word for desires. So what happens is it's our desires that these prosperity gospel of evangelists are preying on. And what happens is because they're preying on that, people think that they can pay their way into heaven by doing good works. This goes back to what Sister Faye was saying about the priest who was teaching her, if you do more good than bad, then that cancels it out. That's righteousness by works. We're not righteousness by works, we're righteousness by faith as Protestants. So therein lies one of the biggest issues. And then just an overarching principle that Sister Faye talked off in her opening introduction. I posted it, I don't think you guys understand. In the New Testament, there's the word no, K-N-O-W. There are two words in the Greek that get translated to the word no. One of them is called Ido, E-I-D-O. Ido is to know facts about something. So I might know Donald Trump's, you know, shoe size. I might know where he went to high school. I might know his or his birth date and everything like that. That's Ido. That's to Ido somebody. The other word that is translated is the word gnosko. Gnosko is to know them intimately. It's, so, it's to know them so intimately that Donald Trump can, po can point me out by name in a lineup. If you just take all these strange people, line them up, it's like, oh, yeah, that's Keith right there. To be known and to be known of, that is the goal of what we ought to do as Christians. So what happens is if we put our emphasis on worldly things and follow after the world, which is what the devil would have us do, we take our eyes off Christ. And we now make these things actually our gods, whether it be a boat, a plane, a house, a business, whatever. Because again, Zacchaeus was rich, but was Zacchaeus post-Christ? Zacchaeus was probably poor, but Zacchaeus knew how to work with money such that in my mind, Zacchaeus was probably the financier of the early church. They said, you want to go to Galatia? Here, here's some money. You want to go to Ephesus? Here's some money. You want to go on a mission trip? Here, here's some money. He was the guy that knew how to multiply money so that using, he was doing it through incorrect means initially, but after he met Christ, he took all those same talents and God, God used those same talents for his glory, for the multiplication of the work. So I think going back to this whole concept of riches, what is like what was said earlier is our initial intent to amass for us stuff to fulfill our desires or as our desire of, the, of our hearts to further the kingdom, to hasten the soon second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brother Mwen done, and we go on to the next question. Yes, I just wanted to add something. Like, as Christians, there are certain brands that we should stay away from. And imagine... I am a Christian, I'm serving God, and I am gonna purchase a car for $1 million. Like, what is that? Do I need a car that expensive? You know, is it God telling me to go and buy a Lamborghini? You know, like, that is self. So, Yes, we can have, say, riches, but what are we doing with all those riches? You know, if, whether I'm driving a car for $20,000 or a million dollars, it is still taking me the same place, but why spend so much money on just one item? And we should be looking to further the gospel and showing people that we are actually of Christ because just the appearance of certain things can tell you a lot about a person. 
Yeah, that's it. We we make a lot of judgments. But we need to be very careful about ascribing motives to people. And the exact same thing you're saying, I can buy a car for $20,000 or I can buy one for $500. They're both going to get me where I need to go. So that means I need to buy the one for 500, right? Well, not yes, I would. Necessarily. I, I, no, I would. I'm not. I'm not but, buying a five hundred dollar car no, because yeah. usually they're not going to last too long. Exactly. I'm going to put no, to, no, to repairs. No. We have I, to be careful with this, ascribing motives to somebody right. else and saying just because it costs this that they're doing this out of the the Our, their lust, their selfishness. I want to tell you, don't do that. You don't know. Brother Rob. Um, All right, hold on. Brother Rob. Um. Let me just say this. Let me say this. Hold on. As a moderator, we need to move on. I hear what Rob is saying. It depends on the motive. And we can't judge. You know what, brother? Let me just say this. So you say you would buy the $500 cars over the $20,000. You buy the $500, and I, I, I've been there. You may end up have to pay twenty to get that working. And tell, can I tell you what? You have, a, you have another no. brother. Brother, hear this. Let me just say this. Brother Rob. You have another person who looking at Moinda who's going to buy the $500 car to say, I can't believe you're going to buy a $500 car when you could buy a bicycle. You are excessive. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Another person yeah. who bought a bicycle says, you have a bicycle when every one of us in the community is walking. You are full mm -hmm. of pride. That's why you got that bicycle. I think Rob's thing is, do not judge each other. Let's examine our own self. We don't. I remember one brother, and he's somebody we probably all know well. God, I mean, when you saw, when you see the vehicle, I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want anybody to know. When you see the vehicle the person is driving, people's like, wow. And I'm like, the brother had to stand up to justify how we got the vehicle because people are judging this person. This is not a person hmm. who would have gone outright to go buy that vehicle. That vehicle was miraculously provided by God. And yet people are judging to say, oh, I'm not surprised that you're driving that. Oh my goodness. You know, what should he do now? Which of course is being used to help others to be used in the gospel work. What he should do now, God bless me with this. So I should give it away. No. So let's just make sure, ask God to help us with our motive. What is excess for you may not be excess for another person, you know, but we need to go on to the lesson. Let's examine ourselves that we are not oh, thinking on, like the world. We are not our motive for accumulating things. All right. And that God is directing us. God is interested in every era of our life. And if we're going to make a purchase that he doesn't think, he will impress us. Don't. All right, Brother Mundi, you have one second. Sister Yulene, you have one second. Go, <laughs> Brother Mundi. I think it's best if we discuss it, discuss it in the afterglow. Okay. Because it's going to take more than one second. Exactly. Okay, minute, because, exactly. All right. We can talk about that. Tell it to the afterglow. Sister Yulene. Let's do the same. I don't want to take the time. We'll go All back right. to that. Basically. And I think I don't know that we can even go on further because I'm looking at the clock and it's. I think Brother Munde is about to tell me now that my time is up. We're not <laughs> going to go on. So the bottom line is here. We, we, we stop at question number 18 because whoever is going to do it next week is what is the corruption of the world to lust? And it comes down, I think Sister Yelaine said it, she was the one who pointed out the mind because that's where it all starts. And I'm thankful that Brother Keith brought it up. You're talking about the desires. The desire, that's what, what is your desire? Are you desiring to accumulate? Are you designed to, you know, what's your motive? Why you're desiring? We need to ask God to search our heart. Search me, oh God, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked ways in me. No matter how much we think we're standing, Sometimes when we look at our brother and our sister, we feel pretty good. Oh, I'm doing so good because just like the priest said, we're not as bad as they are. But when we look from Jesus, we really do see that we have a far way to go. We have a far way to go. And yes, having escaped the corruption of this world through lust, we turn away from that. But you know what? There is still growing. And I know by the grace of God, he will continue to grow us. He which has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can trust him to finish what he has started in each of our lives. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank Amen. you so much for your words. 
your word which is spirit and your word which is life. We, Lord, we ask that you continue to give us a hungering and thirsting after you and to know you more, to really know the love of God, the love you have for us is so mind-blowing. We can hardly comprehend it. As your word said this morning, we have no idea what we will be like when Christ comes. We have no idea. Eyes have never seen nor ears heard the things that you have in store for us. We don't want to miss out on that. We don't want our loved ones to miss out on that. So Lord, we ask that you will prepare us. And we also ask that you will use us. May we be instrument of righteousness. May we be instrument of telling others of your love and your goodness because it's your goodness that leadeth to repentance bless the remaining program for today and help lord that we leave here not just with okay we have talked about this but that we have personally applied what we have learned that we will have the desire to come up higher we're walking high come up higher come up higher and eventually we will go home with jesus to meet you face to face and we know it's very soon thank you lord in Jesus precious name amen amen amen, amen.